Good afternoon. I'm Kurt Levy, uh, President of the Committee for Justice, and uh, welcome to the latest in our series of Zoom panels on everything from uh, Supreme Court uh, and judicial nominees to uh, free speech and uh, regulation of social media platforms. Uh, this particular panel um, is about the approaching end of the Supreme Court term with the possible retirement of Justice Breyer looming and lots of important cases still undecided, uh, cases concerning the fate of Obamacare, voting rights, uh, religious liberty versus anti-discrimination laws, college sports and antitrust, uh, student free speech online, donor disclosure for nonprofits, um, and whether we may all be uh, violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, depending upon uh, what the Supreme Court case, uh, Supreme Court says in a case called Van Buren. Um, so the term should end with, uh, with a bang. And uh, regarding that last case, Van Buren, I should disclose that the Committee for Justice filed and I co-authored um, uh, an amicus brief in support of the appellant, uh, police officer Van Buren, who was convicted of a violation of the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, but I'll leave the uh, details of those cases, um, as well as speculation about uh, retirement to our panelists, um, our experts on the court, uh, John Malcolm, Carrie uh, Sir Severino, and David Latt. Um, after they speak, I'll, um, I'll ask them some questions and I'll include some audience questions uh, that come through the uh, Zoom Q&A function or that were emailed to me. So uh, let me introduce the panelists in the order that they will speak. Um, Carrie Severino, president of the Judicial Crisis Network. She's an expert on the judicial confirmation process. She's co-author of a best-selling book, Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Court. Uh, she had over 100 TV appearances during that Kavanaugh confirmation process. So you've probably seen her on TV. She clerked for Justice Thomas about uh, 13 years ago, and she's a graduate of Harvard Law School. Uh, David Latt, uh, also a graduate, no, actually graduate of Yale Law School. Um, he's a, a lawyer turned writer, a founder of uh, popular uh, legal blogs, Above the Law, and more recently, Original Jurisdiction. Uh, in addition to writing those blogs, he writes for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and similar um, big publications. He's author of Sam Supreme Ambitions, a uh, novel set in the world of the federal courts. And before entering the media world, he worked as a federal prosecutor and an associate at Wachtell Limited in New York. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from John Malcolm of the Heritage Foundation. He's the vice president of the Institute for Constitutional Government, and he's uh, also the director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at Heritage. Before joining Heritage, he was uh, the general counsel of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, he was the executive VP and director of the worldwide anti-piracy uh, operations for the Motion Picture Association. And uh, earlier, he was a deputy assistant and assistant U.S. attorney for uh, the U.S. Department of Justice. So, um, uh, and he's also a graduate of Harvard Law School. Um, let me ask Carrie to uh, start it off. Great, thanks so much, Kurt, and thank you all for uh, joining us here. I feel like it's a, it's a little bit of a challenging time to talk about the end of the term because there's still so many cases to, uh, out coming. I, I was, as I was looking at the cases, I'm, I'm gonna talk about um, a couple cases. One is the uh, California versus Texas uh, or Texas versus California, both of them um, Obamacare case. And one is Fulton versus city of Philadelphia. And it's actually, I think I might have the best chance of anyone of guessing who might write these cases, but because they were argued in November, there's only a few cases left, but it's a lot of, a lot of them still are outstanding. We still have uh, about over a little over half the cases from the term that haven't been 
announced yet. It was a term with only 58 cases all told. So I feel like uh, when Chief Justice Roberts took over and was saying at the time, I think that he wanted to hear some more cases, we have just gone nothing but downhill on that front. And I think uh, this last year of craziness has only added to the problem. So uh, nonetheless, we still have 33 cases out. We're going to talk about a few of them. Um, so as I mentioned, these, these two cases that I'm going to discuss were both argued in the November term. Uh, the first one is one that we actually heard a lot of discussions about uh, during Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation. That's uh, the Texas versus California and California versus Texas case. This is, gosh, take three now of Obamacare at the Supreme Court. I think everyone remembers the first time uh, it was the, really the biggest uh, shot that there was at uh, getting rid of Obamacare via a court challenge, and that was the 2012 NFIB case, uh, the one where, where famously the Chief Justice said actually the uh, the penalty for not purchasing insurance under the individual mandate is in fact a tax, and that's what makes it constitutional. It would not be constitutional if it were in fact merely a penalty. So um, there was in the intervening time, King versus Burrell, which also failed, was not a case that ended up uh, overturning Obamacare. But this really uh, is, a, is a case that turned on then what are the logical consequences of that NFIB decision? Uh, because uh, President Trump uh, has act, had actually uh, removed the penalty for failure to purchase insurance. So thereby taking the um, what was determined by the court to be a tax for not uh, take not uh, purchasing insurance down to a cost of zero. So the question is, if there is no longer any revenue being raised by this, is it even functioning as a tax? And if it can't function as a task tax, then it's simply a is is it simply then a mandate? Uh, with with no other constitutional justification. And as the court held in NFIB, you can't simply, um, under the Commerce Clause justification or presumably any other justification, the court, uh, the, the federal government can't mandate you to buy a product. Um, so this case is, it has a lot of convoluted ways. It, it seems like it might go. It's not really clear how it's going to end up um, on any of them. I think the first question is standing. There's there's a couple individuals in several states who have challenged uh, the law, the individual saying that it's forcing them uh, unconstitutionally to buy a product, the state saying it's costing them money uh, to participate in this program and it's unconstitutional. There's a real question as to whether the court will find they have standing in the first place. Um, that was that kind of was a large portion of the argument was discussing even the, the, whether they, um, whether this is the, the right uh, plaintiffs to bring standing because the mandate maybe doesn't actually command them to do anything and there, or there's no actual consequence if they don't do anything, so there's no harm. Um, the next question is obviously the meat of it on the merits is the individual mandate uh, justified. It's not 100% clear to me. There might be there might be five votes to say that it, that it, now that it, the cost of this tax is zero, that the mandate could be overturned. But the biggest fish to fry is really the issue of severability, and um, that question is far from clear that the court. Uh, even if it found that the individual mandate was unconstitutional, would actually sever it uh, or, or would, uh, would strike down all of Obamacare and would not simply sever it. I think a, a key question is, or key moments were when it seemed like the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh both uh, suggested in their questioning that they uh, they don't think it, it's something that is going to would take down the entire law. And so if you can't get at least one of those votes, it's unlikely that that would take down the whole law. I'll just point out that that, that was some of the ridiculous arguments we heard uh, during the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation that somehow her vote was going to be crucial to uh, eliminating health insurance as we know it. Uh, I don't, again, I don't think she's even going to be the turning point decision on that question. And I think it's also um, it's not going to be, uh, it might, you, may, you may get well fewer than even four votes uh, to, to strike down all of Obamacare if you got past standing and you got past the merits on that case. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch. A second one from November is the Fulton versus City of Philadelphia case. This has to do with uh, a Catholic social services in the City of Philadelphia that is uh, that the state uses to help authorize families for foster care. Uh, they do the home studies that can certify you to become a foster parent, but because of their religious position, uh, Catholic Social Services uh, does not uh, is not able to certify either unmarried couples or same-sex married couples as um, appropriate families for foster care placement. Uh, and for a long time, this was the, the situation and there were, there were multiple 
organizations that do this certification process. And so it uh, it seemed to be going along uh, swimmingly until in 2018, the city discovered that Catholic Social Services was not authorizing uh, a class of couples, the same sex married couples, and they, they uh, terminated their ability to do these authorizations. There were no, and critically, as several of the justices pointed out, there were never, was never actually a case of a, a same-sex couple that was trying to get uh, authorization through Catholic Social Services um, and was unable to do so. So this is one of the questions in the case is um, it, it, this tension between Obergefell and the Chief Justice pointed this out, there's really a kind of a tension that's ongoing between how do we play this out, Obergefell versus religious rights. Um, Justice Alito pointed out that in, in Justice Kennedy's opinion, uh, th he said there, there are it's it's not this is not something that you can no longer as a good citizen and a, a good person believe there are problems with same sex marriage. This is a different thing than, for example, race uh, uh, race discrimination or um, um, anti miscegenation laws. And if we really meant what we said in Obergefell, Alito said we have to be able to find this balance. Justice uh, Kavanaugh also talked in his questioning about finding a balance uh, between these two interests. And the real, um, the goal of this case, I think, was to try to overturn the 1990 Smith decision, Justice Scalia's decision that I think caused a big uproar at the time that, that um, uh, really made it a lot easier for states to, states and, and the federal government to, to um, have, to pass laws that could incidentally discriminate against religion, as long as, as he said, it was a neutral and general, a law of neutral, neutral and generally applicable law. And in this case, the city of Philadelphia says, well, this is, we're, we're not applying it just because of, of their religion. We're, this is a law we apply. This is a rule we apply across the board, no discrimination on the basis of, of uh, sexual orientation. However, um, so there's a question, Smith has been so undermined over the years. The question is, is this is it even gonna stand after this ruling? I think at the end of the day, it's likely following this questioning that Smith will probably stand as just even Justice Barrett, uh, who, who seemed very sympathetic to the Catholic Social Services um, arguments questioned, you know, if we get rid of Smith, what, what do we put in its place? So I think this might be an example of something like we've seen in other areas of the law. Um, Abu, the Abood case is a, is a recent um, uh, example where over the years, you have a case that's starting to get undermined. And in Smith, in this case, it, it, the court clearly doesn't want to extend it. And then they start finding issues and inconsistencies with it. And, but I think until there's maybe some more work done to figure out, okay, well, what is the proper um, standard then to revert to because the, the pre-Smith standards weren't exactly uh, uh, philosophically terribly well thought out either. I think until they get to that point, it, the court may simply continue to cut away at it and not overturn Smith outright. But again, we'll see what happens. There's there's really only um, three cases left from November uh, and four justices left to write than the chief, Breyer, Alito, and Kagan. So I think it's very possible the chief will, will write the, um, one of these big cases. He tends to like the big cases, maybe the Obamacare one. Um, Alito was very active in the questioning and has long been a leader in the court and religious freedom. So my guess is he might write the Fulton case, but you know who knows? We'll see. And I think the other mystery that Kurt alluded to of this term is you know, will we will we have a retirement by Justice Breyer at the end of the term? A lot of people speculate this time of year, every year, and I think um, it, it's not always true that justices Justice Kennedy obviously did retire at the end of the term, but not not everyone does so in that and that timing. I think in particular, it's going to be interesting to watch this time because it's not simply a question of well, it's an end of a term and we have an eighty something plus justice. We're seeing a, a uniquely focused um, pressure campaign on Justice Breyer right now. Uh, there was pressure on Justice Ginsburg as well to try to retire, but I don't think we've ever seen quite this level, um, you know, where now there's groups having mobile billboards going around DC saying, retire Breyer, there's a hashtag for it. Um, there's there's real pressure, you know, there's there's op-eds being written left and right. Um, I think that, that that frankly is a kind of a, a strange approach to me for those who want to see him retire because what Justice Breyer has been very clear about is that he doesn't want to see the court and its nomination process politicized. And in fact, this retire Breyer campaign was launched immediately after he spoke out at his at a speech at Harvard Law School about uh, attempts to pack the court and decried that as a politicization. So I feel like this campaign is is actually probably very counterproductive for the people who are launching it. Fine with me. I I, I think he, Justice Breyer is doing a great job uh, and is, is, is seems to be very with it. Doesn't need to retire anytime immediately soon. Uh, that's obviously not the 
the predominant position of the dark money groups running these uh, these ad campaigns. Though. So, um, you know, I think they're 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 welcome to continue the pressure campaign. I for, for me, I think it's unseemly. I think it's inappropriate for them to do so. And I also think it may backfire. Um, so and I know I know David has some actual uh, reporting on on some of the details that he's been looking into as to the prediction levels. But um, I'll, I'll hand it off the next set of cases. Uh, David, it's uh, it's your turn. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Carrie, for that great overview. And I agree. I think that the campaign to oust Justice Breyer is both unseemly and counterproductive. And my guess, and I wrote about this on my uh, new publication, um, Original Jurisdiction, is I don't think it will work. Uh, I peg the chances of Justice Breyer staying for one more term uh, beyond the current one at about 70-30. Uh, as Terry mentioned, he's extremely active, he's extremely vigorous, he's had more speaking engagements this term than any other justice. A second consideration is, after many years being junior to Justice Stevens and Justice Ginsburg, he is now the senior most justice of the liberal wing, which means he gets the assigning power, he gets to assign uh, important opinions, sometimes to himself. Uh, that's something he hasn't had before, so I think he might want to enjoy it for a term or two before uh, giving it up. And then the last point uh, that Carrie alluded to in terms of my reporting is, he has hired a full set of law clerks. And if you look at the last four justices to retire from the court, three of them slow down their court, their clerk hiring before stepping down from the court. In Justice Breyer's case, this is for the upcoming term, October term 2021, which will start this coming October, and the clerks would change over around July or so. He hired two clerks a long time ago. He's always been a justice who hires very far in advance. He hired two clerks, and then he didn't do anything for a very long time. So that made me think, Maybe he's mulling it over, he's thinking about retiring. But then around March or April, in fairly short order, he hired two more clerks. And that seems to me like somebody who plans to stick around. Uh, maybe he just wants to give himself the option of sticking around. And if he were to retire, then uh, his clerks, his hires would find homes with other justices like Justice Kennedy's clerks did because of the last four justices to retire, Justice Kennedy is the exception. He hired a full set of clerks and then he pieced out. But I don't think so. I think that Justice Breyer was uh, holding on, thinking about it, hired these two clerks a long time ago, uh, and then finally decided, you know what, I'm going to stick around one more time. And one point I will make is among the front runners uh, to replace him is one of his former law clerks, uh, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who's a district judge, a trial judge in DC, and is nominated to the DC Circuit. The DC Circuit, of course, is the most important court after the Supreme Court in the country, and it's a common stepping stone to the Supreme Court. About a third of the current justices came from the DC Circuit. And right now she's only nominated, but she's probably going to get confirmed. And if he retires a year from now instead of now, that'll be just perfect for Judge Jackson because she'll have been on the DC Circuit for about a year. And you don't need to be on the DC Circuit for very long to get the uh, prestige and the experience out of that. Justice uh, Thomas and Chief Justice Roberts were not on the DC Circuit for super long either, but it really, really would help her nomination chances. And I wouldn't be surprised if Justice Breyer would like to do his former clerk a solid. So my guess, again, I've been wrong about so many things uh, over the past year. Uh, I thought, uh, I won't even list them, there are too many. Um, but my prediction is he, he won't retire uh, this year, he might do it next year. So let me talk very quickly about the two cases uh, that uh, are pending that uh, I've been tasked with discussing. One is a very interesting case by the name of Mahanoy Area School District v. BL. And because she's kind of been on a media tour, I'll just refer to her by her name, Brandy Levy. She uh, actually, <laughs> this case has been going on for so long, she's actually now a college student studying accounting. <laughs> but at the time, she was a sophomore in high school who didn't make the cheerleading squad, the varsity cheerleading squad, was not happy about it. So on a Saturday, she and a friend went to a local convenience store, the Coco Hut, I would love to visit the Coco Hut someday, and recorded an obscene Snapchat message where they both raised their middle fingers to the camera and said something like, um, uh, actually, uh, F school, uh, expletive deleted, F softball, F cheer, meaning cheerleading squad, F everything. This little Snapchat message, which is supposed to disappear, uh, I'm not on Snapchat, but this is what the kids tell me. Uh, this message that was supposed to disappear uh, went out to about 250 of her friends. I guess they weren't really all such friends because one of them took a screenshot of it or captured it on her phone and promptly showed it to her mom, the mom being one of the cheerleading uh, coaches. This didn't go over well and uh, poor Brandy got booted off of the JV cheerleading squad for a year. So she and her parents did make a federal case of it. They sued in district court, alleging that Brandy's uh, First Amendment rights were violated. And essentially what this case, uh, the Third Circuit uh, held that they were. 
Uh, and this case raises a very interesting question about essentially student free speech rights in the age of uh, social media. And the question presented as framed in the petition in the briefs is whether Tinker v. Des Moines, uh, which holds that public school officials may regulate speech that would materially and substantially disrupt the work and discipline of the school applies to student speech that occurs off campus because Brandy wasn't at school, she was at Cocoa Hut. So the Third Circuit issued this very broad ruling, essentially saying, trying to have a bright line rule, saying, well, uh, Tinker, this 1969 precedent about uh, students who wore black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. The court upheld that because it was not disruptive. It was just quiet and passive. The question is whether Tinker applies to this off-campus speech. The Third Circuit laid down a blanket rule saying, no, it doesn't. Uh, and based on the oral argument, uh, I think the justices are really struggling with this case. And I think it could be very messy. Uh, in original jurisdiction, I can compared it to a Jackson Pollock uh, painting. It's really, really interesting and a big old mess. Because on the one hand, I think they don't agree with the Third Circuit that you can just have this bright line rule about uh, Tinker not applying or schools not being able to regulate student speech um, if it's off campus. Because you can have cyberbullying, you could have threats to teachers, so you could have all kinds of things that are take place off campus, but implicate school concerns and school officials and students. So I don't think they're gonna go that far. On the other hand, how do you lay down guidance? And there's so many considerations and it's a really tricky case. Uh, and both sides uh, to sort of make themselves sound more reasonable ended up conceding lots of things to the other side. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how this case turns out. I wouldn't be surprised if the court basically vacates the Third Circuit ruling and says, no, 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 you guys went too far. You can't have this blanket rule about the school not being able to uh, regulate any uh, speech if it's off campus, but um, here are some general thoughts. The justices at oral argument said, well, look, I think Justice Breyer and Justice Kavanaugh said, we don't wanna write a treatise on this. And I certainly understand that. And I generally prefer courts to do more, uh, to do less rather than more. But in this case, it's been so long uh, since we've had a case teeing up these issues. I do hope that they give some guidance to lower courts and school districts and students about how to think about free speech of students in the digital age. The second case I'll talk about is NCAA v. Alston. Uh, and this case has some similarities with Mahanoy School District. They're both essentially about what I would call educational exceptionalism, how to establish doctrines like the First Amendment or the rule of reason and antitrust law get sort of tweaked or transformed or moderated when they're in the educational context, because this has to do with college sports. Uh, it comes out of the Ninth Circuit, and the question presented is, whether the Ninth Circuit erroneously held in conflict with decisions of other circuits and general antitrust principles that the NCAA eligibility rules regarding compensation of student athletes violate federal law. So usually when the question presented starts with whether the Ninth Circuit erroneously held in conflict with other circuits, it means the Ninth Circuit's going to get reversed. But if I had to go out on a limb here based on the oral argument, I'm gonna say that actually the Ninth Circuit could actually get affirmed here. So this case is very interesting because it has to do with uh, essentially antitrust law uh, with college sports, which are a huge business. The March Madness tournament, which was going on around this time that the case was argued, generates more than a billion dollars in revenue for the NCAA. And uh, this case arises out of a, a class action brought in 2014 by a bunch of division one football and basketball players uh, who were challenging this cap on education related benefits to student athletes. So, this, so these include things like postgraduate scholarships, tutoring, study abroad, things like that. No one is saying, oh, we're gonna pay these student athletes a million dollars. It's not really on the table. Um, really, it was a challenge to this cap on these education related benefits. The Ninth Circuit ruled against the NCAA, basically saying you can't limit these education related benefits to student athletes because essentially this is a straight up antitrust violation. You have a bunch of schools that have these uh, athletic teams and they wanna keep their costs down in terms of not paying these athletes uh, much money or any money. So they basically said, well, in the name of amateurism, preserving the amateur nature of these sports where they're not getting paid like pro athletes, we're going to essentially have these NCAA rules that allow all of us, all the schools who are normally competitors in the market for talent to just get away with not paying anybody anything uh, or having these caps on these education related benefits. So uh, based on the skeptical questioning of the NCAA's attorney, Seth Waxman, I think the justices might actually say, no, 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 uh, NCAA, uh, you guys are governed by antitrust rules too. Uh, your talk about amateurism, which 
some of the justices seem to sort of be skeptical of. I think Justice Kagan said, well, it's very high-minded of you, um, but I think that they're basically going to say in the end, you are governed by the same antitrust rules as everyone else, and you can't basically just get together with each other and have these rules so that you can lower your labor costs and not pay these athletes anything, especially since some of these coaches for college athletics, as one of the amicus briefs pointed out and as Justice Thomas pointed out in his questioning, are making um, millions. Now, the flip side is, um, you know, the, some justices expressed, expressed concern about so-called blowing up college sports or really affecting detrimentally college sports, which millions of Americans enjoy. Uh, and so I think that how this decision gets written is even, you know, perhaps more important than what the ultimate outcome is. Maybe something else it shares with the Mahanoy School District case. It's, it's really the devil is, is in the details. Uh, and so the question is, how can the justices preserve principles of competition that are essential to the antitrust laws without doing damage to the college sports that so many uh, Americans uh, love and enjoy? So anyway, it'll be a very, very interesting case. One other final commonality, commonality I'll point out between these two cases, besides the educational context, the connection to sports, the messiness likely of the opinions is they're not gonna break along partisan lines. A lot of people complain that the court has become political and uh, it's all just uh, six, three or five, four along political lines. Based on the question in both of these cases, we could end up with some interesting and odd alliances in terms of how these are written. Or maybe we'll get up, maybe we'll get a ruling that has a, has a broad range of support, but I don't think we're gonna see a six, three conservative liberal break in, in either of these cases. Uh, good analysis, David. Uh, last but not least, John. Great. Well, thank you, Kurt. Delighted to be uh, here with uh, with you all. Uh, so I'll offer my two cents on, on Justice Breyer. I'll stick with, with David's language. I actually think the odds are probably more 70-30 that Justice Breyer will peace out and head back to uh, uh, <laughs> to Massachusetts. But, you know, I that 30% that comes from what Carrie was saying, which is I think that this very unseemly campaign to get him to retire uh, could uh, backfire. Uh, uh, David mentioned uh, Judge Katenji uh, Brown Jackson as being an odds on favorite. I'm not sure he would be doing her a solid by giving her a year on the DC circuit, gives her more ammunition for people who might like to shoot her down. And one other uh, judge to keep in mind is uh, Justice Leondra Kruger of the California Supreme Court, who was a Stevens clerk and is also highly regarded in, in liberal circles. So I've got, I've got three cases to discuss, so let me get to them. One of them Kurt alluded to in his introduction. It's a case from the December sitting, Van Buren versus United States. So this is a case that involves the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is a federal statute that imposes civil and criminal liability for unauthorized access of computers. The central question in the case is how the statute applies when an individual is authorized to obtain information from a computer for some purposes, but not others. So the case involves uh, a police officer in Georgia, Nathan Van Buren, who was clearly authorized to search computerized records uh, about license plates, et cetera, for law enforcement purposes. He got into trouble though, when he searched those records for private non-law enforcement purposes at the request of an FBI informant who offered to pay him several thousand dollars for the information. Van Buren was subsequently charged and convicted of violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and that conviction was upheld on appeal. So the statute sanctions any person who, quote, exceeds authorized access on a computer. And the statute further defines that term as meaning, quote, to, ac to access a computer with author authorization and to use such access to obtain or alter information in the computer that the accessor is not entitled so to obtain or alter. I put the emphasis on the word so. Van Buren, of course, was entitled to obtain information that he accessed for law enforcement purposes, but not for non-law enforcement purposes. And while acknowledging that he is certainly subject to discipline uh, and termination by the police authorities, he claims that the criminal statute doesn't apply to him. The government's uh, argument that the statute applies to Van Buren's conduct hinges on the meaning of the word so in the phrase, so to obtain an alter. So while Van Buren's counsel argues that a defendant does not have authority so to obtain or alter the information, only if he doesn't have authority to obtain or alter it for any purpose, the government argues that the word so is much, uh, should be construed much more broadly in terms of all aspects uh, of access, including whether a defendant was authorized to obtain the information in a particular way or for the particular purpose that he did. Van Buren has quite naturally stressed the potential reach of the statute under the government's interpretation. For example, 
if an employer uh, uh, you know, states that an office computer can only be used for work-related purposes, would an employee be violating the statute if he checks his Facebook page uh, from that computer? And Van Buren argues that simply relying upon prosecu prosecutorial discretion to weed out uh, those picky union cases like that is not a very satisfactory answer. So at oral argument, a few of the justices expressed concern uh, that exonerating Van Duren's conduct would remove protection for personal privacy, particularly important consideration in the internet age. Some of the justices though appeared to be mollified by assurances from Buren, Van Buren's counsel that there are other federal and state criminal statutes that apply to invasion to privacy and breaches of personal information. The government offered some potential limiting instructions of the statute, but the justices seemed somewhat skeptical of that, especially Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Justice Gorsuch, in fact, wondered whether the government's interpretation would, quote, perhaps make a federal criminal of us all. Most of the justices seemed to believe that the language in the statute was too vague or that this prosecution was misguided, and that could, uh, in all likelihood, spell bad news for the government, but we shall see. The next cases I want to discuss are actually two consolidated cases are from the February sitting. They are Brinovich versus Democratic National Committee and Arizona Republican Party versus Democratic National Committee. These two consolidated cases involve challenges to two of Arizona's voting provisions. The first is an out of precinct policy that requires that ballots be rejected if they are cast at the wrong precinct. And the second is a state law banning ballot harvesting, which is the collection of ballots by third parties. Regarding the first provision, roughly 90% of the state's counties assign voters to a specific precinct based on the voter's home address. A voter who shows up at a polling place where he or she does not appear on that precinct's voting rolls can cast a provisional ballot. But if the election official later determines though that the person voted in the wrong precinct, that ballot is discarded. The second provision makes it a felony, punishable by up to two years in prison and $150,000 fine to collect and deliver another person's completed ballot. Although there are exceptions for family members, caregivers, mail carriers, and election officials, they are allowed to uh, collect somebody's ballot and deliver it. The Democratic National Committee of Arizona argues that both of these provisions violate section two of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits policies or laws that are racially discriminatory. They also contend that the ban on, on ballot harvesting was the product of intentional discrimination by the state legislature and would thereby violate section two of the 15th amendment to the constitution, which prohibits states from denying people the right to vote on the basis of race. The challengers lost, the, Demi the DNC lost at the district court level, but they prevailed in the ninth circuit sitting on banc. In reaching its conclusion, the Ninth Circuit, Circuit purported to apply a two-part test called the results test to both provisions. The first part of that test focuses on whether the policy or law being challenged disproportionately affects the ability of, of a racial minority group to, quote, participate in the political process and to elect candidates of their choice. If it does, then the second part of the test focuses on whether there is a link between the challenge policy or law and social and historical conditions that created the inequality and opportunities in the first place. The Ninth Circuit concluded that both the out of precinct policy and the ballot harvesting ban failed this results test. And the Ninth Circuit also ruled that the Arizona legislatures intended to discriminate against minority voters when they passed the ban on ballot harvesting, thereby violating section two of the 15th amendment. The challengers, Arizona's Attorney General Mark Brinovich and the Arizona Republican Party represented by Mike Carvin contend that section two of the Voting Rights Act only requires an equal opportunity for all voters to participate in the state's political process and that it only prohibits laws that cause substantial disparities in minority voters opportunities to participate and the ability to elect uh, representatives of their choice. They argue that when you consider all of uh, Arizona's entire voting system with mail-in ballots and early voting, uh, that it's clear that racial minorities have ample opportunities to vote in Arizona. They argue that both of these provisions, which are race neutral and they set claim are designed to enhance voter integrity, have only at most a minimal impact on minority voters and that the state's concerns about voter integrity are legitimate. They also argue that the Ninth Circuit's results test would subject near, nearly all ordinary election rules to challenges under section two and would mandate court 
court ordered overhauls of state voting rules in order to achieve some form of racial proportionality. And they stress that section two guarantees only equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. And that the results test that was used by the Ninth Circuit is primarily to address claims of vote dilution, not vote denial. A lot at issue here. At oral argument, several of the justices appeared sympathetic to the argument that Arizona has an interest in election integrity and that both provisions advance that interest. The Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh specifically noted, for example, that in 2005, a bipartisan commission on federal election reform that was co-chaired by former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker had recommended against ballot harvesting as a voter integrity measure. The DNC's lawyer acknowledged this interest in voter integrity, but urged the justices to focus on how these particular policies impact minority voters, arguing that minority voters, especially Hispanics and Native Americans, rely extensively on ballot harvesting a lot more than white voters. When it was all over, it seems likely that a majority of the justices are going to uphold both provisions of Arizona's laws. What's less clear though, uh, is whether a majority is going to be coalesce, able to coalesce around and what the appropriate standard is for determining whether voting laws and practices violate section two of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Uh, so we will, we will see how the, uh, the court comes out. So Arizona is likely to win, but there'll be a lot more at play in terms of what the appropriate standards for future cases are going to be. The last case I'm gonna discuss also involves two consolidated cases and that's in the April sitting. It's Thomas More Law Center v. Bonta and, and Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta. So these consolidated cases involve a challenge by two nonprofit groups, Thomas More Law Center, which is a conservative Christian public interest legal group and Americans for Prosperity Foundation, which is linked to uh, the Koch Foundation. It describes its mission uh, as educating citizens to be advocates for freedom. They are challenging a California state requirement the charities and nonprofits operating in that state have to provide the state attorney general's office with a copy of their federal tax returns, including their Schedule B, which lists the names and addresses of their largest donors. Relying extensively on the Supreme Court's 1958 decision in NAACP versus Alabama, which involved a challenge to an Alabama rule requiring the disclosure of the NAACP supporters, the groups contend that this disclosure requirement would violate their First Amendment right to free association by discouraging their donors from making donations. The groups contend that 47 states regulate charities without any, any disclosure requirement of this type, and that state attorneys general, including California state attorney general, rarely uses such information to initiate fraud investigations, and that if they really need that information in a particular case, there are less intrusive ways of, of, of obtaining it. Regardless, they contend the Attorney General of California's interest in regulating charities is not sufficiently compelling to justify such a significant infringement on their First Amendment rights. Thomas More also argues that even if the court rejects their facial challenge to this requirement, it should rule that the requirement, the requirement is unconstitutional as applied to them because of the likelihood that its donors will face retaliation or intimidation because of their deeply held religious beliefs. And that in, in light of that, many of their donors may well conclude that the risks of disclosure are simply too great and that therefore they should no longer contribute to the organization. Americans for Prosperity makes a similar argument and also points out that the California Attorney General's office can't be trusted. And they cite various examples of previous breaches of confidentiality, including an instance in which California employees posted over 1800 confidential Schedule B forms listing the names and addresses of charitable donors on a public website. California has countered that the disclosure requirement is closely related to the state's interest in regulating charities and that regulators routinely review those records when they investigate complaints against charities. They also argue that the challengers have not adequately demonstrated that their donors are deterred by this requirement. And while they acknowledge these past failures, such as posting these, the information to public websites, they argue that the state has recently implemented new and improved confidentiality policies that should adequately address the problem. The challengers prevailed at the trial level, 
Uh, but they lost before the Ninth Circuit, which held that the policy merely requires charities to provide states with the same information that they already give to the IRS, that it's related to an important state interest in policing charitable fraud. They also rejected the group's argument that their donors would face substantial harassment if the information became public, stating that the, stating that the state collects this information for its own use and that the risk of accidental public disclosure uh, is now small. At the Supreme Court, the United States Solicitor General's office weighed in, at least in part, on behalf of the California AG's office. They argued that the court should not apply strict scrutiny to this disclosure requirement. They should rather apply a less stringent exacting scrutiny test, uh, scrutiny test uh, and that the disclosure requirement had only an indirect effect on the rights to associate. The Solicitor General therefore urged the court to reject the challenger's facial uh, challenge to the requirement, but they did urge the justices to remand the case to the Ninth Circuit so that they could reconsider the scope of potential harm to the group's donors uh, and, and whether or not their applied challenge uh, has merit. A wide range of groups from across the political spectrum filed briefs supporting Thomas More uh, and Americans for Prosperity, while on the other side, 15 US senators led by Sheldon Whitehouse uh, of Rhode Island urged the court to uphold the disclosure requirement to help combat the influence of the evil dark money. Uh, after oral argument, it seems likely that the Supreme Court is going to uh, side with the challengers on either their facial or as applied challenge. Uh, although Justice Sotomayor seems sympathetic to the state's rationale for needing the Schedule B forms, uh, stating that if the Attorney General needed the information and had to issue a subpoena or an audit letter to the charities, that might tip off bad guys who would then be able to take steps to hide their illegal conduct. Several of the justices voiced concerns about the past problems California had with inadvertent disclosures of sensitive information. They were openly skeptical that these problems had been uh, solved. Uh, and while some of the justices appeared to be debating whether they should consider the facial challenge or the as applied challenge, uh, the group's attorney noted that the challengers in this case had been litigating the case for seven years uh, and that it would be, to use his words, a pyrrhic victory if the court were to rule in favor of these two organizations, but allowed the disclosure requirement to stand uh, against other nonprofits who would then have to initiate their own litigation uh, about whether the application uh, you know, of that disclosure requirement on them would survive and as applied challenge as well. So that was a lot to cover. I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Kurt. Um, thank you, John. And um, let me um, direct the uh, first uh, question at you. A, um, a member of the audience asks how the uh, uh, HR1 and S1, the bills in the House and Senate, um, pertaining to voting rights and uh, campaign uh, expenditures, um, how those will affect um, the Arizona cases. Let me make it a little bit uh, broader. Um, there's been a lot of controversy around voting rights and the flip side of, of voting fraud, a, a bunch of disputes concerning the 2020 election, uh, the more recent uh, change of law in Georgia leading uh, Major League Baseball to take the uh, all-star game out of Atlanta, and of course the controversy over these bills. Um, I know that justices aren't supposed to let uh, political considerations like this influence their decisions, but uh, you know, how do you think in reality uh, it's gonna affect uh, the outcome of these cases? Well, I can answer that question in a number of ways. I mean, one is to look at the particular issues that are involved, which is a, a, a ballot harvesting ban uh, and outer precinct policies a majority of states have both provisions. I think it's like 30 or 31 states have ballot harvesting restrictions uh, and a similar number uh, have an outer precinct policy that, uh, that matches uh, Arizona's. And I, and I think the justices will have to pay attention to that. With respect to HR1 and S1, the, the For the People's Act, something that Ted Cruz and other Republicans have labeled as the Corrupt Politicians Act. Uh, I don't think it is likely uh, to become law unless the Democrats uh, you know, eliminate the legislative filibuster exercising the nuclear option. But if they did, uh, and if the For the People Act passed uh, and President Biden signed it, it would have a dramatic effect and would probably, I mean, subject to challenges to that act, 
uh, would uh, basically eliminate both of these provisions. The, uh, the, the For the People Act explicitly requires all states to permit uh, ballot harvesting, and it, and it requires them to uh, count out a precinct uh, ballots. It's, it's an 800 page, page bill. It covers a lot more than that. Uh, it would essentially be a federal takeover of our election process, but it would certainly affect the two provisions at issue uh, in the case pending before the Supreme Court. And another uh, questioner asked about whether those bills would, uh, would be uh, upheld as constitutional. I think that goes beyond the uh, subject of this panel, but you know, I'll also add that you know, we need to see what of provisions in the current bills actually uh, make it into law, if any, before uh, I would even ask you all to, um, to speculate about that. Um, let's also talk about uh, the uh, Obamacare case. Um, I'll direct it at Carrie, but, but John and, and David feel free to weigh in. There was a lot of controversy um, about that case during the election, during the Barrett confirmation, but I've heard very little about it since the election, um, uh, you know, uh, basically the world was going to turn on it, um, but but now it seems like not a big deal. Why the the change in uh, at least media coverage of the case? Uh, yeah, I think really the reason we heard a lot about it during the, the Barrett hearing is because they had nothing else to try to go on. It was it was bizarre. I remember her hearing every single. Democratic senator had a picture behind them of people who were going to lose their health insurance as a result of this case. Again, premised on the idea that she was going to be the deciding vote in the case, not necessarily clear, and that it was going to then strike down all of Obamacare. Again, not clear that there's at all five votes for that, um, with or without Barrett's vote. So uh, I think all of that was really just based not on the actual reality, but on what do we think, what polls well? And so apparently they thought this is what's going to poll well, and this is what's going to drive people, uh, you know, to, to vote against Trump, to be concerned about Barrett, um, despite the fact that it's not actually related to the reality of the case. Um, someone had actually asked the question in the, um, and the question and answer, what, what happened if they hadn't taken the case? And it's that the Fifth Circuit had found had already found that the, the individual mandate unconstitutional, but they didn't say it was going to be striking down all of Obamacare either. They just remanded it to the district court to say, let's look at do some fact finding. Um, I think it's so the, 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 the end of the day for all of the hair on fire discussion, the real world impact actually was it was really questionable. There was going to be any actual impact. And as um, I mean, we, we don't know what would happen in, in, in what's going to happen in real world, but as was argued in the case, um, OMB basically predicted that if you get rid of the individual mandate, everyone's going to behave exactly the same. Now, it's hard to imagine everyone's going to behave exactly the same, but basically it's going to be a very minuscule difference in the number of people who are going to purchase health insurance and not is their prediction. If that's so, then I think that even more underscores that it was kind of much ado about nothing um, and really politically based rhetoric rather than something that has to do with what's really going to happen in the case. Can I add one thing to that, uh, uh, Kurt? So I, of course. I, you know, I agree with what, what Carrie said about you know, what was happening at the Barrett hearing, and they, they didn't have a lot to go after, so they, they chose that as the one or two uh, things to, to focus on. And you know, predictions about how the Supreme Court is going to come out in a particular case are always perilous. I mean, everyone thought that Obamacare was going to be struck down before NFIB versus Sebelius happened. But I think that one of the reasons you're not hearing a lot about it is because it seemed fairly clear at the argument, again, sometimes we can be wrong about that, that a majority of justices were going to determine that even if the individual mandate went, it was severable from the rest of the law and the law would survive. I think that if this were after oral argument, there was a lot less clarity about that and people were really were worried that Obamacare was going to disappear, we'd be hearing a lot more about Justice Barrett and the threat that she poses. Well, that makes sense because certainly following the uh, argument in the 2012 Obamacare case, um, you know, it stayed very much in the news and there was quite a bit of worry that, that it would be struck down. Ultimately, it, it was not. Um, David uh, pointed out uh, similarities between the uh, Mahanoia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and the NCAA cases about how rules may apply differently to, uh, to uh, schools and colleges. Um, another similarity that, that occurs to me is that they both sort of relate to the uh, 
the loud debate that we're having about uh, big tech. Um, in the case of Mahanoy, it's about, um, you know, is there uh, free speech online? Um, now, of course, um, there's a, a state actor involved in the Mahanoy case, but people are uh, very much worried about free speech being uh, diminished by the social media platforms. And then in, in the case of uh, the NCAA, um, it reminds me of the whole antitrust debate about the big tech companies where there is a debate about whether they're violating current antitrust law and there's the Klobuchar bill and others that want to expand antitrust law. So let me ask all of you, um, to what extent do you think the decisions in, in Mahanoy and the NCAA case will impact those larger issues of free speech online and uh, the breadth of antitrust laws? So I'll, I'll take a whack at that. And maybe this is kind of funny of me to say, since these were the cases I was discussing, but I actually would probably minimize their importance in the sense that I think Mahanoy, and I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, the way you did it, based on the Chief Justice's <laughs> pronunciation or argument um, and the Wikipedia entry. Mahanoy is probably going to be one of these like busts. You know, there's some cases where you get all excited about it and then you get this opinion, it's like, wah, wah. It's like, oh, you should have just like, you know, dismissed it as improvidently granted. Like that was pretty useless. Like I think Mahanoy could end up, again, predictions are perilous as John mentioned, but I think Mahanoy, they're gonna end up basically saying, third circuit, you went too far, but uh, figure it out again. Like, so I don't know that it's necessarily, people were saying, oh, this is going to be the most important decision in 40 years or since Tinker. I don't, I don't know that it will be just based on how it could get written. On, um, on Austin, I also think it may not do much for the broader tech uh, antitrust debate because uh, as applied to athletic conferences and sports, antitrust law is already so weird. I mean, if you look at cases like Flood and American Needle and all like, it's just so weird. Like they had, even outside of the educational context, they do get more leeway, I think, uh, in this argument that, well, these uh, things are pro-competitive because they're making a more appealing product. Like in this case, people like, well, some people were, some of the justices were kind of snarky at this oral argument, like, oh, people just like seeing unpaid people go play sports. Like, how does that enrich the experience? But, um, and there was even some debate about the survey that the NCAA had taken. But anyway, I'm actually thinking that these cases, um, even though I was the one who discussed them, I don't think they're gonna be as consequential as maybe they could be. Uh, do either of you uh, disagree, Carrie or John? I think the, the court tends to like to write as inconsequential decisions as it can get away with. <laughs> so that's always that's always a good bet if they uh, if they had their druthers. Yeah, I, I guess I would say, look, these these colleges all receive a lot of federal funds for one reason or another, and it, it's so obvious that they have gotten together and and colluded to come up with rules about how to treat student athletes that suit their purposes and that the consumers in this case, the athletes themselves, even though it may be unseemly having you know, people on campus receiving tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, they are elite athletes. The schools are making a ton of money off of their names and images and reputations and athletes can get hurt and their careers can disappear uh, on a moment's notice. And I think there's something at least uh, a little compelling about that. I, I'm not sure how much those considerations transfer over to the tech world where, and I'm not defending big tech, but these are, you know, private companies and, and there's stuff related about section 230 that may be at play. The antitrust issues and antitrust inquiries tend to be very, very fact specific. I, I don't know how analogous they are. Uh, while we've been uh, talking, a couple of people have emailed me about the uh, 2020 election and the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, accusations of voting fraud. Um, so let's return to that for a second. Um, were any of you surprised that the court didn't take up any of those disputes? I think a lot of people thought they might at least take the, uh, the Pennsylvania case. I was surprised at that. I was not surprised that they didn't take up any of the cases before inauguration, but the one that affected a congressional race that raised the same legal issue, uh, I, uh, with Justice Thomas that I, I was a head scratcher as to why they didn't take that case. I mean, maybe they just are, are hoping that next time these issues come up, people will litigate earlier and they'll have a, you know, it'd be Trump specter won't be involved, but I was still surprised and, and frankly disappointed that they didn't take up that case. Uh, David and Carrie. I think it's an important issue and I agree with John. I think that 
Uh, it's a recur potentially recurring issue. I think they they should have taken it. One thing that I think is kind of interesting, and just you know, I'm, I know a lot of our listeners are probably legal nerds like us. Um, this whole issue of original jurisdiction, and I'm not just mentioning it because of a shameless plug for my website, but it is interesting how the court has this policy of essentially treating these state versus state cases as discretionary, uh, even though the language of the statute and the constitutional and prudential concerns kind of suggest that, no, if anyone's going to be adjudicating these cases like Texas versus Pennsylvania, it should be the Supreme Court. And Justice Alito had a really good, or what I thought was a really good dissent from one of these denials uh, that was joined by Justice Thomas saying, whoa, 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 like where do we get off doing this? There's no basis for this in any text or structure or history of the constitution or any statute. So I hope that the court considers this original jurisdiction issue and, and focuses on it. Yeah, and, and I have, yeah, I, I think I, I agree with what, what has been said up to now and I and agree with, with John's statement of, I'm with Justice Thomas. I think in particular the argument that we, we all understand, I was joking before the court tries to be inconsequential, but they hate the idea of getting involved in anything. They, they don't want to see Bush versus Gore again. None of us really wants to see Bush versus Gore again. I think the challenge is you are the Supreme Court for a reason. And it's it, it, sometimes it, you, don't, you, the, you don't have a choice. <laughs> the, the, maybe one of the downsides of being in the Supreme Court is you get so used to having a choice, but which cases you can take that you think it's all an option. Sometimes a case comes to you and you have to, you have to do it. So well, well, in some of the cases, it's like, okay, yeah, they delayed too long. They should have brought this case earlier. I, I get it, that makes sense. But they did have that opportunity at the final, final stretch there to say, hey, here's, a, here's a, one that we could do it where we're not even doing it in the middle of the yeah election. That I think would have been the perfect chance, as Thomas pointed out, to do it where it's it's dramatically diffused and you can hopefully step back. I mean, that's it, the, the challenge is if it, also with this bad facts make bad law thing. I, I don't envy the job of a justice trying to set aside his or her strongly held personal beliefs in any of their cases, let alone something as, as, as uh, consequential as the national election. But it would have been much easier to do so if it's not going to decide the national election itself. So I think that would have been a nice time to, to take it. Hopefully, I, I, I'm hopeful that maybe before we have to deal with any of these laws again, um, or assuming any of the, the kind of crazy last minute stuff is, is gonna be happening again, which maybe it will, given the fact that it wasn't smacked down last time by the court, um, that we can have this uh, cases brought in earlier fashion so they can be addressed um, in, in, in as orderly manner as possible, I guess, under the circumstances, because it is stuff we want to see clarified. I, I love the mantra of you need to, we want to make it easy to vote, but hard to cheat. And the court has to be part of that, trying to make sure that the rules are applied evenly across the board for everyone. Um, and so hopefully we can get, get that uh, figured out better for the next time. And that is an important issue. I mean, what the meaning of the electoral clause is in terms of who gets to set these rules and whether or not judges or, or executive branch officials can change those rules. It, it's a, a monumentally consequential issue. It is an open question. And I, states need some kind of clarity, clearly. Yeah, it looks like we have uh, unanimity on that. The court probably should have taken the Pennsylvania case and, and you know, for two reasons. One, that it's a very important issue that only the Supreme Court decide can decide. And also that it had uh, original jurisdiction and, uh, you know, what does original jurisdiction even mean if the court can uh, can swat the case down so easily? Um, let me um, ask a more general question. You know, I remember when we did a panel like this a year ago, everyone was talking about the novelty of telephonic argument at the court. And now that's kind of become the norm. Um, do you think it's um, making a difference, telephonic argument relative to the uh, old style of arguing in person? And do you think we'll ever uh, see that old style again? And that uh, certainly, certainly makes a difference for, for Kerry's old boss, Clarence Thomas. We've, we've gotten to hear from him and that has been a very, very welcome change. Uh, and one thing that I, I fear is that they're not gonna, well, there are pluses and minuses to telephonic arguments. I've just named what I think is the big <laughs> plus. They're not gonna stick with it. And my guess is, is he goes back to not talking very much and that would be a shame. <laughs> And everyone else goes back to talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do look forward to them being back in the same room. But it, it would be nice to see if there's a way to. I, I. I don't know how you would do it practically, but try to introduce a little. It's. It's really pleasant in my mind to listen to too, because it's like, oh, it's kind of this systematic. You know, you. You. The justice can carry out their 
their line of questioning. Sometimes it's annoyed because even even the justices get cut off. It's funny to yeah. hear the justices. Oh, I mean, I, my time has expired. <laughs> like you're the you're the judge here. But um, but it is uh, it does make it pleasant to from the listener's perspective, I think, as well. One idea that I proposed for when we return in person is, and no, I, I realize they have limited time, et cetera, but if they could have a little bit up front, I don't know, 20 minutes, something like that, where they did have this seriatim questioning where each justice got to ask a question or two uh, so we could hear from all of them. And then you made it the usual free for all for the balance of the hour or however much time you've allotted. I don't think that that would be a bad thing um, because then we would get to hear from every justice, including Justice Thomas, who often has great questions. And uh, at the same time, all the people who say, oh, it makes it harder to sort of get at the nub of the issue or to follow up or to press advocates, they get their, their bit too at the, at the back end. So I hope we don't just go back to exactly the way it was. I like uh, David's idea. And uh, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. So I just want to say uh, a thank you to uh, our esteemed panelists for making this uh, uh, a very interesting uh, panel. And, uh, you know, we do these panels frequently. So tune in again soon for another interesting topic. And all, hopefully we can all, all three of you back at some point. Take care now. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt.